The first thing they did was um, provide us with um, bomb shelters. Anderson. Anderson? Yeah, Anderson shelter. They were corrugated steel. Kind of like a Quonset hut. Small Quonset hut. That's what it is. Quonset hut. So you installed those in your backyard? According to the size of the family. It was just my grandmother and me, so it was quite a small one. We used it quite a bit though. <laughs> But they weren't very pleasant, they weren't very good. They, uh, they weren't leak-proof and um, damp and they weren't ventilated inside so you always had the wet walls. I could think of a million things in the bomb shelter. Mitten alone remained as Hitler's sole barrier to a total victory. When did you first know that the Germans were going to start the Blitz? Was it 1939? 1939. 39. 39. 39. And you'd hear the sirens? Yes, the sirens were located at the local town fire halls. And the signal would be one long blast, like, um, like a whale. Mm -hmm. Ooh, one thing. The all clear, when it was all clear, it would be a short blast. A bunch of them? Yes. It was always at night, mostly at night. Um, you picked up your supper and took it with you into the shelter. Tea, you always took tea. <laughs> <laughs> so British. Yeah. Mm. And then we, we may sometimes the all clear would go after a couple of hours. Then we'd creep back in and go to bed. <laughs> but if it lasted all night, we stayed all night mm. till breakfast. The alarm, the first alarm was a, like a wailing. Oh, and the all clear was. Oh, oh, oh. I was in the service with. Uh, an incendiary bomb. You know incendiary bombs? Mm -hmm. They were dropped to set fires. Mm -hmm. And we had one through the roof of the, our house and um, it landed um, on my brother's uh, pool table. He had a pool table mm -hmm. up there in his bedroom. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, the uh, incendiary bomb burned all the felt off, off the table before they put it out. What happened was they drafted the, the women for the first time. Uh, they did that to try to replace the men that were being lost. And you had to be between the age of 19 and I think it was 25. Well, I happened to be 19 at the time. Well, we, were, we had to go. I had to leave my job and um, they interviewed me and they asked me which branch of the service I wanted to go into. And I said, the Air Corps. And they said, you can't go into the Air Corps because I was a stenographer. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I knew how to write too. But um, they said, you have to go in the army. So I ended up in the Royal Artillery, uh, always stationed on an anti-aircraft gun site. The air defense of the fort is in the care of anti-aircraft detachment, which also operates the anti-aircraft searchlights. The technical equipment of the fort is naturally in the hands of the Royal Engineers. Besides doing all his correspondence, I had to type the daily orders, what we called the daily orders. That was the schedule for the day. Something like we have here every day. It was, you know. and, uh, and I also was in charge of the rations. I was the ration clerk every day 
they, I had to know the number of uh, rations needed for the day. We had two guns. They were 4.5 millimeter guns. Okay. And we had two sites. We were the headquarters site, and there was what they called the off site. I was uh, at headquarters with the major. Was there much activity where you were located? Oh, gosh, yeah. Apart from your job, uh, <coughs> if you were in the, like me, in the office, you had to learn the operation of one instrument on the gun. Well, we had two drums, and um, I was on what they called the height and range finder. That, it was an instrument and I had to get it right there. And it, um, it recorded the incoming and the range mm -hmm. of any bomb that was being shot. Right. Did, the did, height and the range. Did it have like a, a long tube on it with two yes, it eye had, holes? It was would... about that long. Yeah. And in the middle yeah. was this dial. Yeah. And we shot one. German came down and um, in the, in the, quite the way out in the water and um, the, uh, the life savers went out to the wreck and um, brought back the pilot. Well they brought this German in and I happened to be on guard duty and I was in the guard room that night. And they brought in this um, German. He was soaking wet and he, he'd been hit. And he was very, very proud. He wouldn't talk. Mm. He never talked. Mm. And the police came and took him away, so I don't know. Mm. But that was the only one we actually saw. And I happened to be there. We never predicted anything. We did day by day. Everything was done by the day. You just hoped and put up with it. Mm -hmm. What did Winston Churchill mean to you folks? Oh, he was our idol. Mm -hmm. And he still is my idol. He was fabulous, believe me. And they were always broad broadcasts on the radio. Of course, we didn't have TV. Right. And um, people just waited for his words when he came on at night. They'd all sit around the radio waiting for his, what he's going to say. And I would say that he was the main thing that kept us going. We depended on what he was going to tell us, and he never pulled any punches. He never, he never made it sound good when it wasn't good. Let us therefore brace ourselves to our duty, and so bear ourselves that if the British Empire and its Commonwealth last for a thousand years, men will still say, this was their finest hour. We knew there was going to be something. We had a feeling that the troops were all coming from all over England for something. That we didn't know what it was going to be an invasion. And um, at the time, the day, V Day. Well, let's go back. All right, now, let's stay with D Day. I missed that. Talk about D Day. Oh. D Day. You know, this is all, what you were talking about all the troops coming into England and. The yeah. invasion. Yeah. Yeah. Coming from all over England. And was the, the roads were nothing but vehicles, but loads and loads of tanks and stuff. And I was in the, the artillery. I was on a, a gun site uh, in the middle of England. In the middle of us. And we knew something was up. <coughs> we didn't know what it was, we knew there was something in the wind that they were going to finally move. And um, 
we we suspected something the night before. Uh, I was in a pub. <laughs> of course. Yeah, I was in a pub, and the rumours were flying. Something's coming up. Something's coming up. Sure enough, the next so we uh, they came past our camp along the roads. Nothing but vehicles, vehicles. We knew something was here. Yeah. It was the invasion. Oh, we went crazy. We were waiting for that. We got fed up with just, you know, being bombed and couldn't do anything about it. The V1s, well, I was back in London then. The V1s weren't too bad, but the V2s, um, they were lousy, but I don't remember the others, it just said feed ones I remember. They would destroy whole streets, whole roads. Because there's no notice, I mean it just came so fast. Oh, oh yes, there was no warning, it never had any warning. Yeah. Thank God for America, you know, and um, I thought they were <laughs> I think they were noisy, some of them. Some of them liked to drink too much. Well, yeah. I thought they were like that. They were uh, saucy, cheeky. Mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. Not like the British guys who mm -hmm. were more sedate. You know. right. Also, they were better paid. They had loads of money. They were throwing their money around, attracting the, the wrong kind of girls. Mm -hmm. They didn't <laughs> seem to be able to distinguish between a rotten girl and a good girl. And um, I didn't think much of them at first. March 29, 1945, telegram sent to Agnes Renton yeah, that in was London. Yeah. March 19, 1945, from Sergeant Lester Pfluger, Munich, Germany. Telegram reads, have 24 hour pass, stop. Get ready to get married, stop. Arriving Saturday. Stop. Love, Lester. <laughs> That's, where did they get that from? So we got married on the last day of the war. Oh. Today we went to the church, got married. We said goodbye on the steps of the church and he had to go right back to Europe. We never consummated our marriage <laughs> till I came over. You're fascinating. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, I, I wrote my biography for my son. I have one son. And uh, he said, Mum, you've got to write your life story for us. And I have a granddaughter that's hot on history. Mm -hmm. She's, she had it all copied for me. We've yeah. obviously filmed it, and you're now a movie star. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I hope it gives me a good appearance. Oh, yeah. Very good. Well, that now I can see why Lester wanted to marry you. Yeah. Yes. Well, I'm 95. I mean, I can't look any better. <laughs> <laughs>